Welcome to the June meeting of the Business Tunnel Society. Uh, tonight's uh, presentation is on small diameter tunnel excavation and secondary lining construction methodologies at Thames Tideway Central. We have three speakers, uh, and I've already uh, Hamein Savila is a senior project manager for the west sites of Tideway Central for ferrovial construction. He's worked on the Thames Tideway project for the last five years. He holds an MSc in civil engineering from the Polytechnical University of Madrid and a BSc in business studies from the Open University. He has more than 12 years experience in large civil engineering projects in Spain, Middle East and the UK. Juan Mendez is a project manager for Falcon Brook Pumping Station Worksite, again working for Ferrovial Construction. He's worked on the Thames Tideway project for the last five and a half years. He holds an MSc in Building Engineering from the Open University of Madrid and an MSc in Project Management from UEM. He has more than 10 years experience in residential and large civil engineering projects in Spain and the UK. Hodge Rabura is a site agent for the Crimea Wharf Development Worksite in Ferrovial Construction. He worked, he's a graduate in MSc in Mining Engineering from the Polytechnical University of Madrid. He's been in the project for the last three years where he's completed several SCL and RC works in tunnels and shafts. Previously, he worked for five years in South America as a tunnel engineer for several large mining companies. Welcome to you all. Thank you. The floor's yours. Thank you. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, as my colleague has told you, uh, my name is Jorge Rubio. I'm here to present you a little bit about the SCL. First of all, when my managers came to me and told me, you're going to do a presentation to the BTS, the British Tunneling Society, about SCL, I thought it, this is like, I don't know, like going to Santiago Bernabeu to teach them about football. <laughs> so, Please, I'm going to focus in uh, my experience, personal experience, and uh, what I understand what is more important in terms of uh, providing a good uh, SEL project. Uh, so this is kind of the briefing. I'm going to introduce on the understanding of SEL. I've, as, uh, as he's told already, I have a background more in, in uh, drill and blast, basically. So I got involved into the SEL that there's a bit of a difference. I'll, I'll go through it. Then I'll go through the pre-construction uh, key uh, items that we need to have to focus on before starting a, a tunnel. And then during construction in these kind of tunnels, we need to have some kind of uh, things in, in mind before starting. So as I told you, uh, SEL is kind of, well, when I just joined here, it told me, do you know about SCL? And I said, what is SCL? So it's spray concrete lining. I said, yeah, that's secret. But it's not really secret, no? Uh, as I told you, I was used to NATAM. So NATAM usually, what you do, you drill, blast. The rock usually is uh, you know, hard rock. And you leave the, the substrate to, to settle itself. Then you provide a fortification around. And then you can uh, uh, spray secret. In SCL, usually used, uh, for, for example, in the UK, it's been used in urban areas. So urban areas, your idea is to avoid any, any possible settlement of above structures. So the idea in SCL, you need to focus on controlling advance and timing. So you need to have a kind of understanding on short advances and, uh, and provide a, a fortification as soon as possible. So with these, the difference is uh, we're trying to avoid any extra uh, fortification in the face. So usually you avoid any gear there, you avoid any, any mesh in the face. You just do your excavation in, in a title we've done uh, 
less than a meter, in between half a meter and a meter, so you can control and spray a ceiling layer, usually a rubber 75 mil uh, ceiling layer, and then uh, provide exclusion zone that I'm not going to go through it. We, we have already been working in an uh, underground environment, so we know, and, uh, and produce a procedure. So we go through the SRG, it's a meeting with everybody involved in the, in the tunnel, needs to take the decision for the, for the, for the in data that we are receiving, so monitoring any settlement, any possible um, uh, groundwater, and, uh, and that's it. Then we produce the rest, that is kind of a sheet, easy sheet, where you can, where you can follow the next 24 hours uh, excavation requirements and, um, and follow it. You brief your team and then you go for it. Okay, so uh, going for it now, uh, connection tunnels in Tideway Central. So we're just focusing on Tideway Central, there's west and east. Tideway Central is composed by seven sites uh, on Kirling Street. Six of those sites are offset from the main tunnel, so they all, they both, uh, they all need a connection tunnel to connect to the main tunnel. And uh, this is kind of the idea. So from west, from west to east, we have a bit of a fall. West usually, we're gonna look at it later, but uh, it's more uh, into the, into the um, uh, top, top section around 60 meters above tunnel design. And then the east area is, is getting into the Harwick and uh, Lambeth Group area that we'll have a look on it later. So, as a general view and having a look on the numbers, this is kind of, we're looking at it, so uh, from le uh, west to east, Falcon Brook, Cremon, Chelsea, uh, Hibs, Albert and Victoria, they are kind of uh, short connection tunnels, the, light, the longest is uh, Falcon Brook, it's 238 meters, and the shorter is uh, Albert, if I'm not wrong, no, sorry, uh, yeah, Albert, 14 meters. So we're talking about around 20,000 tons of material excavated and around 4,000 something cubic meters of, of SCL sprayed. So as I told you, key elements for us, pre-construction, first of all, and the most important in the ground conditions. We need to realize where and how we're gonna face uh, in, 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 in front of us. So what's the tunnel we're gonna be facing? Then we have site setup and a plan and equipment we're going to be using, usually in a big mining project or whatever. You can use big machines. In here, we're talking about tunnels that are below three meters diameter, so we need to realize how we're going to feed everything. Also, the sites are next to the river, quite tiny areas, confined, so we need to, we need to have a bit of a, an understanding that, that could produce a bit of a change in, in our project. And then uh, trials, as, as everybody knows, you need to provide assurance to your client that you are able and capable to do your job as per standards. So the best way you produce some trials, whatever you're facing, and uh, so basically to let them know that you're, you're capable of doing it. So as I said, key element pre-construction ground condition. So what we can see here is a uh, Ferrovia uh, Langrook gets the contract, okay, they say, we're gonna build a tunnel here. We need to understand what is in below uh, London, London uh, surface. So they contract ACOM, ACOM produce, well, get a bunch of uh, information from, uh, from Thames uh, water information, uh, historical drawings, historical boreholes, uh, all kind of information and produce a nice 200 pages uh, documentation that uh, gives you all the information. So I took, I took a profile of what I, th I reckon in, this is uh, Curling Street. So what we can see is uh, I divided into the three different aquifers that we have uh, below London ground. The main one is the lower aquifer that is, uh, it is in this low section that would be with the, in the chalk and uh, up to the Tanet, Tanet Sun formation also getting the lower part of the Lambeth Group area, that is the, the Sapnor formation. Also, the, the upper aquifer, that is, that is just uh, above the London clay, that is a nice low permeability material, 
That is the, the upper aquifer, usually is the made ground, that is around four meters deep. It's around 200 uh, years of, of age, so you can find whatever in there that has been pulled on in, into the. Then we have the, the alluvium uh, and, the, and the river terrace uh, deposit. That is uh, linked to the, upper, uh, to the upper aquifer. Those works, or any work in that area, is going gonna, gonna to be tidal work because that, that aquifer is connected to the Thames River. So for example, all our connection um, uh, inter, inter, so the, where we interface the, the existing sewer are built in this area, and it's, it's kind of an interesting area. And then, uh, mainly all our connection tunnels were built in the London clay. It's a, as I told you, it's a low permeability material, so it's and usually battery material, quite easy to work on it. But uh, I highlighted this section because, as I told you, from west to east, we have a bit of a variance because uh, the main tunnel goes fall from west to east. So the west side is built, has been built in a nice battery uh, London clay, but the, the east side of, of Thames Tideway Central uh, is being built in this area. This area is uh, where we can find uh, what we know for uh, sand, sand channels, okay? That is the Harwick or the upper malted beds uh, and laminated beds. That is kind of between uh, 60 to 50 something meters below tunnel design. Okay, this is a profile, so just to have a look. So you can see the London clay on the top, Harwick formation starting, and then the Lambert group with you can see a bit of a sandy material in there. I took, I took this just to explain how important is the uh, a geological uh, assessment to, to, uh, into the tunnel. So this tunnel, this is a Cremont connection tunnel. As you can see, I think the, the axis here is around uh, 62.5. And, uh, and uh, this is Victoria connection tunnel. That is around 56, 55. So the difference is that uh, Cremon connection tunnel was 147 meters and was done in less than three months. Uh, Victoria, that uh, you can see the, the white area is the Harvick formation and this brown area is the Lambeth group. Uh, was that is 17 meters and was done also in three months. Uh, yeah, site, site, uh, site setup and plan uh, and equipment chosen. So this is a picture from one of our sites. You can see the congestion on it. Uh, you can see, for example, we had uh, four, four silos. Each one can have the capacity for 40 tons. So we have a capacity of around 120 tons on site. 120 tons will give you around, I don't know, seven to 10 uh, advances. In our best times, we're doing five to seven advances per day. Also, you need to take into account, you need to have a backup uh, in every, every time you open a phase. So in terms of logistics, it's quite tricky. Uh, you need to plan ahead because your deliveries is only on the day shift, so you need to be aware of it. Also, I highlighted um, one of our uh, Macaway uh, systems. So we were lucky that almost all, all uh, Tideway uh, sites were able to to send the mac away through the river. That allows you to keep uh, the site congested and use those boats just to fill it up and send it out. Usually, in uh, good times, we were having uh, one barge every two days, around 500 tons. Those were on the, on the shaft times. Another thing that you need to have in, in consideration before starting the jobs is, is what I call the, well, it's been called the passing base. So this, is, this has been implemented uh, by design uh, for tunnels longer than 100 meters. This is basically, if, if you think to, into a three meters diameter tunnel, you need to think, for example, mark away when you're 200 meters away, you cannot be feeding a dumper in and out uh, unless you have some kind of uh, passing bay where you can once it's coming one back, you can take the other ones, fit in it. So for example, in Cremont, we use three dampers at the same time. We set up one in the, in the face, being fed up, 
one in the passing bay and one outside uh, feeding the, the Macaway skid. And I think you, well, we haven't done it because at the end the line uh, was, was good, so we had enough uh, pressure from, from the pump to pump up, up to the face, but we were struggling in Falcon Brook, that is 238 meters to, to pump into the face, so the idea was in, in a, if you need it, you need to set up a pump, so you pump from the top, that is around 70 meters up to the pit bottom, then whatever you need to the pump, and then from the pump, pump again to the face. So as I said, we didn't need it, but uh, it was set up for that. And another thing is, uh, well, you need to w manage your wastage. If you think about a line 200, around 300 meters, you're going to be spending around four to five cubic meters of, of wastage every time you need to spray. And if you get into a situation, you need to bulk excavation. You're sealing layers time and time, so uh, the wastage can, can become quite, quite high. Plant and equipment. So this, I highlighted the main, the main plants that were useful for us. So, so our Ferrari was uh, these ITC excavators. It's, it's a shape, uh, tiny but powerful, uh, good for a big diameter. So above 3.2 meters, we were using it. For, for smaller diameters, we use the, the Celtic Miner. I told you about it later. So this was quite powerful. It could even break uh, up to 200 mil of, of ceiling layers. And uh, easy to feed our dampers. So you put the damper just behind, and you can feed it uh, while you're excavating. So that allows you to, to be macking away at the same time you're excavating. Uh, the other one was the Celtic Miner. This is same kind of uh, plant, but smaller. So it's quite tiny and uh, it has the power, the power, the electric power quite bigger. So if you don't have a passing bay, it's quite difficult to, to put it in uh, and, and have the mac away. You need to, to have a kind of a setup. So we used it in, in short connection tunnels. It, it was using heat wall connection culvert that was 38 meters and it was struggling at the end of the, of the tunnel to, to, to give the power. And um, yeah, the Oruga is the other one. So Oruga is quite tiny sprayer. It's not a potenza. It doesn't, doesn't have the same powers, but quite useful. It's only 1.2 meters uh, width, and uh, it can reach uh, 50 degrees on each side and, and 45 degrees. So you can reach every, every kind of uh, position in the tunnel. Then trials. So I focus, yeah. Every, everybody knows we need to do trials to, to assure the, the client our, our quality. So I focused this, this experience we did in, uh, in Cremont. So uh, this is the profile of, of our uh, deaeration tumor that is inside the connection tunnel that would be used to, to uh, once the water comes down, uh, pressure will push the air out. So we have an HVP pipe connected into it. In the SEL times, you can see a profile here. This was 275 mil of uh, non-fiber shockcrete. With this, we had to install three different layers of uh, rebar and spray in different phases. So we did a trial, and, uh, and as you can see, I, we set up a, a panel, an, an overhead panel, to, to replicate the, the, the actual location of the, of the HTP pipe. And, uh, and did, we did, actually, this was a fight with, for me because I remember this was the first trial, uh, having a discussion with our uh, lead miner. He wanted to, to put the, the, um, the accelerator higher. And uh, I discussed with him, you need, to, you need to start lower with the accelerator to make sure that the encapsulation is good enough. Then later you can start turning up. Well. We see he didn't let me uh, follow my, my advice, so we started in 5.5 in, uh, and uh, got up to 7.5. It was kind of good, some of the course, but you can see some, some voids in the middle. So we tried again. We started with 4.4 and uh, uh, got up to 6%, and that's the course that we obtained. So at the end, it's, it's good to have the good team good people on site, good engineers, and try to, 
to make everything. At the end, you need a you need accelerator to make the, the, the shockrate stick, but you need to make sure that the encapsulation is good enough. Uh, yeah. So during construction, I've, I've, I've focused in several several things, but I'm, I think I'm gonna focus in su surface dewatering. I'm gonna give you a case that we had in pumping in Heathwood pumping station. So this is a, a plan view from Heathwood pumping station. You can see the CSO shaft and the connection tunnel, 44 meters. Uh, yeah, so basically, in here, we had uh, the, the geo geotechnical and hydra hydraulic uh, study from ACOM that we had uh, the intermediate aquifer at around 58.7. Uh, uh, the surface is around 103 point something, so it's around 50 meters of, of uh, shaft. With this, what happened that, that the connection tunnel, the, the axis was at 60 and the invert was around 50 something. So we set up a um, surface dewatering to reach this section and lower down to 60, uh, sorry, to 56. So we managed with that uh, control the pressure in below the shaft and the, and the tunnel also we set up 20, 22 well points from the, from, from the site, reaching the uh, 56 to pump out the water. And at the same time, when, when starting the, the connection tunnel, we set up three interventions of well points, the same, trying to reach 56 and pump whatever water we have in there. With that, we manage uh, controlling the overpressure below the, the shaft and the tunnel. We also set up four uh, relief pipes that reach four, four meters below to get to make sure that you reach this this aquifer, and uh, and uh, in case on a, of an over uh, pressure, uh, the the pressure relief through there. We just put some granular material just to avoid any any blockage, and this worked quite well. We went quite easy and nice and smooth in in Heathrow. Uh, yeah, so I wanted to, well, the probing is, is thing, uh, what, um, so we have a, a geotechnical study, but we need to assure that what is in the study, because it's based in information in, in boreholes that can be 20 meters far from your face, so you need to make sure that what you're going to face is what we are considering. So every, every kind of 15 meters we were doing the probing, the probing, you need to, to do some drill on the top and some drill on the sides reaching the, the inbed area and one reaching the top section. Uh, we, for example, that is an example in, in this is a Falconbrook tunnel. We managed to avoid the probing because we had quite a bit of information. We had all the information from the, from the boreholes and we have really good uh, historical information, so we managed to to remove the probing. And uh, in terms of logistics, it's quite tricky, the probing, uh, combining it with the, with the SCL. And uh, yeah, I wanted to focus on also in construction tolerance. So uh, this is the Amberg system. I'm pretty sure in the UK you, you're quite used to it, but this is the first time I, I saw it in here. And first time I saw it, I was, I was like, this is amazing. You, you can get so accurate into excavation and SCL that is quite useful and you need a good driver and a good sprayer. So this is kind of a profile of, uh, of the, so let's say for example, if you need to excavate, uh, you cannot see properly, but uh, when excavating, you have a tolerance plus 150 minus zero, so you cannot excavate less, but you can over excavate. But using these kind of tools, in, uh, it gives you the possibility of getting tied to what you need. Because if you get 150 uh, over excavation, you're going to get 300 mil over uh, excavated. That would be more mac away, uh, more time the face open, more uh, shock needed. And uh, so, yeah, it's quite a useful. Uh, tool and I'm gonna leave it here. This surface preparation, I'm gonna leave it for for my colleague Juan. So thank you very much. Juan.
Hello, hello everyone. Thanks for coming. Finally, my missus made it, so uh, just in time. And I hope not to bother you too much because it's uh, enough late and we'll go to the pub to have a good beer. <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> cheers to that. So, um, after the SEL and the primary lining, obviously we come with the, with the secondary lining. Um, and I'm gonna try to focus on the overall scope that we did in, in a tight way, um, us and our um, partner, Leino Rourke. Um, and then I'll try to talk about how the waterproofing process is um, and the two systems that we used, the uh, split invert and crown shutters and the uh, full round shutters. I'll try to finish with some outputs, best practices, and some lessons learned. So uh, this is a photo for introducing the scope, but basically we did around 686 meters of secondary lining with uh, seven different cross sections uh, going from 2.4 ID, the smallest, to 4.8, the biggest, um, and a bunch of different lengths, uh, obviously, but the first question would be, why didn't you make them all in a similar dimension, yeah? <laughs> and that would be one of, the, of those that if we could go back, we would probably look at it. But nevertheless, we accepted the challenge and we went for it. Um, to do the secondary lining, you need to assess the environment you're working on. So as I said, we had uh, different sections, we had a very aggressive environment, um, wet substrate, the durability requirements were a very big challenge. They have been uh, through the whole duration of the project and they are still uh, a, a big issue for us. Um, the waterproofing interface and whether, which system would you choose um, and the uh, tunnels being very depth, very long, some of them, logistics around it make them difficult. Uh, finally, and this is the best tip, do not underestimate time for trials. Uh, arriving to get a concrete mix that could work for all of us was a very big challenge. And why is that? Because each tunnel was different and because you normally do trials either in winter or summer, uh, but you'll never, you'll use that mix over the rest of the, of the seasons. So you don't know how it will behave. At the end, we had also big GGBS content on the mix uh, as part of our works information, but we developed a self-compacting mix that has had up to four iterations. That was good enough to start. A retention of a minimum of four hours, which was quite good, and an early strength of 10 MPA up 24 hours. Um, we also managed to reduce the requirements for striking the shutters and uh, improving the mixes. We were getting up to six to eight MPAs in around 14 hours. So we got to a good, we got to a good cycle. Uh, pumpability proven in Falconbrook, which was the, the longest uh, tunnel, uh, which where I'm the project manager, I'm very proud of <laughs> our tunnel, um, was, was quite easy and the finish at the end of the tunnel is one of the best of the, of the project. So uh, it was quite good. So on waterproofing, uh, this is a photo, not of our tunnel. Our tunnels are smaller, but uh, to see how it's involved in waterproofing. So uh, to get an approach at what was our um, classification of the tunnel, uh, German standard uh, uh, classifies our tunnel as a class four because it's a sewage tunnel. Um, water infiltration allowed in this, in this norm is 0.5 to one um, liters per square meter and our works information requirements get that down to 0.2 liters per square meter in a maximum length of 10 meters of tunnel. So you can see that the requirements are quite onerous. Um, so then you can say, what do we do? A drainage system or a barrier system? Um, obviously there's pros and cons against one or the other, but the main one would be, this is tideway. We are 60 meters below ground level and the plan is to uh, do uh, surveys, inspections of these tunnels every 10 years. So it would make no sense to do a drainage system. Yeah, it's cheaper, but requires a lot of maintenance and requires eventually pumps to get that water out. And the other one is that it's a sewage tunnel. So you don't want got water to come in, but obviously you don't want the sewage to go out because it would contaminate the, the aquifers. So the... Um, the solution was clear. Uh, we went to a barrier system. You can see there uh, an outline of, of how it works. 
So in brownish, the, secondary, the primary lining, then we install a geotextile membrane followed by the um, membrane of waterproofing and a water bar in every construction joint. Finally, we applied the secondary lining. Um, key things about waterproofing, uh, probably one of the most important ones is the surface preparation um, and the substrate. So what made this project different was that we got rid of the regulating layer, which is always a pain because the limiting tolerances for that regulating layer are quite onerous and you never manage to achieve that. Um, so you can see there on a sketch from our subcontractor, uh, waterproofing subcontractor, Renesco, that allows you to have a fairly bumpy surface where they can um, apply their geotextile. So um, it, was, uh, it was quite easy to achieve that. Um, obviously, we had to do some milling here and there, but, but it was quite good. And uh, what you see there, that tool is the scarifier that uh, was uh, very helpful for us as um, it helped us bend all the fibers, which were a no-go for our friend Mario that I can see here with us. Um, so then how do we um, install this waterproofing? So you have, we have access requirements and we managed to, to resolve all of this uh, with different peri-travelers that were uh, very, very useful. So what you would do is uh, load your tunnel with waterproofing materials if it's long and, and impossible and then you'll be laying rails in the, in the um, invert to um, mount all this uh, peri-traveler waterproof the crown, and then you'll follow uh, with the invert. Um, this is a photo of how the waterproofing works are being done. You can see crown has been completed, and then the guys are working on the invert. Um, the quality standards for the waterproofing were quite onerous as well, um, but uh, our subcontractor had had a, a, a lot of experience uh, and a very robust system, and you can see there how the membranes were welded together with a double seal on the top right, um, how the, the water bar uh, system works, and we were um, doing tests in every single uh, joint uh, for two bars up to one hour. Uh, so we can say that we install a pretty robust uh, waterproofing system. Finally, the VA anchors, which was a, a tool normally used for um, reinforcement alignment in tunnels. So basically, a VA anchor is an anchor that you can uh, introduce inside the waterproofing, but it's uh, waterproof as well. Um, so it's a plastic cap, and then you can um, thread in a, a, a bar that will help you, uh, in our case, hold all the reinforcement. And you, as you can see in that uh, photo, we were doing first the reinforcement installation of the crown, and it was holding hold it in these BA anchors, following by the by the invert. Because obviously, once you've installed your invert reinforcement, you cannot work on top of it as you would smash it. So then the different, or uh, moving into the different shutter systems, um, we had three, or we assessed three for the project. The typical invert and shutter crown, the so-called Ferrari, which was the one that was finally used for uh, the secondary lining of the main tunnel. Uh, this is a replica of what uh, Kern uh, quoted for, for Falconbrook. Um, and finally, the full round shutter, which, as you can see in the 3D image, is pretty simple as a concept, but uh, provides a lot of flexibility. And I'll go through all of them. So, which would be the key considerations um, to choose the right shutter? So um, you would start by the cross-section that you have. If the tunnel is too, uh, too wide, you wouldn't be able to go for a, a full round shutter. Um, the radius, the curves, so if it's a very steep curve or, or it's a, an easy one, length, um, if uh, the concrete you have, if it can be a, a it must be a full hydrostatic because it's a, it's a self-compacting mix or, or you can control the rate of rise, um, uplift, um, tolerances, uh, some systems are um, more robust than others and would control better the uplift and, and hence better for the tolerances. Um, another waterproofing, uh, junctions, uh, etc. We actually didn't use any of these shutters for the junction into the main tunnel because it had to be a proper bespoke timber and whalers shutter, like old school. 
Um, the other consideration, obviously, always health and safety. We are uh, down to uh, follow the BS British Standard 6164, and we need to take into account all this when choosing our shutter. And moving into the invert and crown split shutters, you see that's a, a very, um, a, a, a very um, closed uh, a space with all that crown shutter and all those whalers. That's why you wouldn't use this shutter, for instance, in a, in a long tunnel. And I'm going to talk to you about an example uh, about Chelsea um, connection tunnel, which was around 44 meters, and the diameter was quite big, was 4.8. So um, it was done in seven pools with an invert and, and crown system. You can see in the next photo how the guys were uh, laying the invert reinforcement, well, first the invert waterproofing, then the invert reinforcement, and on the right hand side photo, you can see that the invert has been put already, they have installed the rails, and the crown shutter is following uh, on top of those rails. Um, as a detail, um, on the right hand side, that um, drawing shows a design change that we had to make because obviously the links go normally radial. To the, um, to the reinforcement, uh, to, the, to the tunnel. But in this case, um, having this construction joint, which would be horizontal, uh, would have a clash or would be less tidy than, than, than we would like to. So we change those links, uh, increasing the quantity of, of steel to make it more uh, uh, construction friendly. Um, in this image, you can see the invert uh, shutter uh, from DOCA, which was the a subcontractor supplier that we use for the works. Um, and I don't know if you can see it very well uh, there, but there's some loads uh, that are imposed uh, into the, into the uh, lining, uh, and they are 25 kilonewtons uh, each. And you can see um, they, this, these loads go into the lining at the top and at the back, and they are pretty low uh, for um, for, um, for the construction, and then we'll talk about how the full ground shutter has much heavier loads. Um, this is a photo of um, how the system works. Uh, looks pretty, um, pretty easy, but at the end it is. It's a steel gantry with some uh, shutter form, uh, and it gets um, propped against the lining, and there you can, you can do it fairly easy. Um, after that, we, go, we do the installation of the reinforcement with, again, using the Perry platforms, which have been very, very useful for all the stages of the, of the secondary lining. And finally, we go with the crown, with ha which has much higher loads. You can see 91 kilonewtons, but they are only in, uh, in, in certain legs. You can see there are two, four, six, in seven legs, and they go um, bolted into the invert that you have previously poured. So you have a very robust uh, um, surface to prop against. And this is the photo or the final photo of uh, a poor day of a crown in, in one of our small tunnels. Um, finally, I will talk about the full round shutter system. Uh, and I like to call this one my baby because we develop us and Cremon together um, the, the solution and the improvements, and uh, I think it was a great achievement from a project perspective that we could find synergies between the sites and synergies between the different sections, and we effectively use uh, four of these shutter systems to build six of our tunnels. So uh, it's, a, it's quite an achievement, I think. Um, we consider two examples, uh, the Falcon Brook uh, connection tunnel, which, was, which is 250 meters long, a section of 3.9 meters ID of around 44 meters, and the remaining is 3.2. And uh, as well there, the Chelsea one, which a very, with a very uh, steep curve of around, uh, or 15 meters, sorry, and then straight length um, of um, 2.4, I believe it was, um, 2.5 meters uh, ID. So I'm going to choose the Chelsea example to try to explain the shutter and the uh, benefits of it and, and how, we, how we like it uh, in, in, um, in Tideway. Um, Chelsea one was uh, 19 pours, an average of eight meter length, uh, fairly reasonable quantities of concrete, 
Um, in Falconbrook, we had to fill those passing bays that Jorge was talking about earlier, and we, we, we managed to do a pour up to 140 cubes, which was quite intense. Then the heat produced inside that was, was uh, very heavy, but a fairly uh, flexible system. So how does this work? Um, basically, it's segments forming a ring and ring forming a cylinder. Um, what's the difference? Because this is nothing new. This has been in the business for a few years. Um, the background that we had was that the panels were weighting uh, around 70 kilos. And we managed to reduce that uh, to around 38, 40 kilos maximum. We also introduced some uh, hand handling bars, as you can see in the photo, which uh, really helped the guys take it between two operatives to overhead. If you think 38 kilos doesn't seem that much, but when I went to the factory and I left, lifted the first one, it was, it's quite difficult to get it just yourself overhead. So um, everything that could be done to improve the manual handling and the, and the working environment of the guys was, was tried here. Basically, once you have your, your ring, you also have some props, vertical and horizontal ones, and we have what we call the spot bars, which are the uh, bars that position the, sh the shutter uh, in the center of the tunnel. Um, the spot bars were very, very important, and we managed to do up to 1.6 meter long spot bars, uh, but the design of them uh, was key uh, for the success of the tunnel. That's why this doesn't work for a very uh, wide tunnel, because your spot bars would fail, or you'll need very robust ones or bigger. Uh, I don't think it's ideal. So what we can see there is a photo of uh, the assembly process. You do, a you do a few inverts and then you complete uh, your tops. To con you keep controlling, uh, we did this with Amber system, system as well. You keep controlling the, the shape as you go. And, um, and then once you have finished it, you just uh, go with your uh, stop end at the end and then you pour. Um, the example for Chelsea. So you can see there that um, some of the segments um, or all of the segments are a different shape. Some of them uh, are longer and some of them are shorter. If we would to install uh, in a hit and miss way, long, short, long, short, we would be going straight. But if we install all the long ones in one side and the short ones in the other, we would be going in a curve, let's say 15 meter curve. But then as well, if we interchange them in a pattern, we could achieve the 20, 25 meter curve that was required for, for Cremont, or in Falconbrook we had 200 meters and 300 meters curves, which also um, were uh, pretty easy, just changing your sequence. Um, I was talking about the spots, and this, is, this was something um, that looks pretty uh, in-house, but it really solved the problem. We had to certify to our client that the spot bars were not going to puncture the membrane. So what did we say? Okay, let's start trying. We got some membrane, some uh, conveyor rubber belt, which is um, quite robust, and uh, we bought a press, and we started trying different arrangements of geotextile, conveyor belt, and a steel plate to achieve something that could take the maximum 120 kilonewtons that were going to uh, to be required uh, to be supported. So we did several trials, and at the end we came with, with this uh, solution, two layers of geotextile, that geotextile was installed only locally, um, and then uh, the waterproofing system and a steel plate on top. How this did look in reality? A little bit different. So you can see that SHS uh, is welded to the plate. Why? Because if you're trying to install this um, uh, protection system overhead, and then get a spot in. By the time you're trying to get your spot in, your plate will fall. So you needed to have something to help it or guide it into position. And that's why we installed this addition uh, to the system that work. A couple of photos of how the spots arrangements were made. So you can see there probably top left, the best, the best one, very long spot bar, probably 1.4, 1.5 meters, and how it gets uh, up to the waterproofing and uh, props against to maintain the, the shutter in position. Obviously, um, in Falconbrook, in this passing base, we had a, a up to a five meters column of concrete above us, and that was uh, creating yeah, around 120 kilonewtons in each spot. So imagine a cylinder that is 3.2 uh, 
um, meters diameter trying to float in a liquid. Uh, the, the forces are, are very, very, very big. And this is a finish of uh, one of our tunnels. And you can see that the finish is pretty good. Uh, the only um, repairs required were really around the spat holes that once you remove the spat, you need to go back and fill it with mortar. Uh, but again, we did uh, some value engineering and uh, we only uh, filled around the 250 mil um, first um, part of the hole. We left the rest uh, in the passing base and the likes without filling because it wasn't required. So pros and cons. So basically the, the split system is better for small, smaller, uh, for bigger tunnels and shorter tunnels and the full round system uh, is better for longer tunnels and uh, if you have sharing uh, of diameters between, between tunnels. Um, very well for hydrostatic pores um, and it leaves you a monolithic structure which is always more robust. So finally, some outputs, best practices and lessons learned. Um, on the waterproofing outputs, uh, we managed to do around 52 meter, meter square per day. Um, in bay lengths of six meters, uh, the split system uh, around two pools per week, six, seven meters long uh, on a, the only day shift pattern, same for the full round shutter, but around two to three uh, pools per day uh, and eight meters long. So rough numbers, I would say that the full round is as twice as quick as the um, split system. Um, you can see here a few things we've been talking about. Um, the SEMA drain, the SEM drain was a, a membrane that we had to install in the invert of the, of the split system to, to, to help the bubbles of, um, of air going out and it improved a lot. The finish, scarifier we talk about, um, the design, bespoke design of the full round that we did for ourselves, reuse of the conveyor belt and the cherry system which I haven't spoken yet, but um, the traditional thermocouple systems for assessing uh, maturity strengths uh, are pretty conservative. They are good, but they are pretty conservative. With this cherry system, we were monitoring at the same time the, the temperature inside the concrete and taking that temperature into a cube uh, tank that was at the same temperature. So our cubes were always at the same temperature of the concrete and curing in the same conditions. So at the end, it's a very empiric proof and very, very good proof to assess the early strength. This is where we get to these 14 uh, hours to get 8 MPA. And uh, finally, some more best practices of, or lessons learned. Uh, again, allow time for trials. Uh, we even uh, purchase half of a shutter system uh, four meters long. We did a trial in the Cremon tunnel uh, in, in, a, in a section that was going to be backfilled afterwards with foam concrete. Uh, and there we study up leaves, uh, how the system behave, uh, any interfaces. So we learn a lot from that. Um, then uh, you, need to, uh, you need to check the direction of traveling if you're going backwards or forwards. Uh, logistics are key for this. Um, at Falcon Brook, we managed to load, preload all the tunnel with the reinforcement and the waterproofing materials. So that saved us a lot of time about passing through the shutter uh, in and out uh, with materials. Um, and I, I, I spoke already about the cherry, uh, a key item uh, to save time uh, as well. So that's it for me. Jaime, up to you. Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. Um, to finalize the presentation today, I'm going to present the last piece of a small diameter tunnel that we completed at, time, at Tawit uh, Central. So it's a three meters uh, diameter open face pipe jacking, which I believe is quite interesting, especially how we implemented a micro tunneling solution in a very, very challenging uh, location where traditionally probably we, ha we would have gone to, to a different uh, open, uh, cut and cover solution, but I'll go through it in a sec. So this is Albert Embankment. This is one of our sites, and this is where this pipe jacking took place. So this yellow line here is the new Clapham culvert that we had to build. So the complexity of the site 
is very, very uh, clear. And this is because we had a number of assets that are present on site. We have the tidal environment and we have also very important stakeholders. So you can see here that we were doing all these works right next to the MI6 building. We had a residential building here, very uh, high standards as well. And uh, we had to comply with some uh, noise uh, limits that were imposed uh, in the DCO. So again, this is just listing all these big challenges that we, we were facing when we first look at this piece of work. So here, this is a plan view of the reference design. So you can see here Vauxhall Bridge, and in yellow, this is the Clapham culvert that we had to, we had to build. So originally, how we envisaged this at tender stage was that we were going to build a, com a combi wall a cover dam and then build this Clapham culvert in a canta cover fashion. The problem was that you can see here a cross section of the coffer dam and this circle here is the Victoria line. So we were four and a half meters away from the Victoria line. So when we engage with London Underground, obviously one of the first conditions that they put on us was that we had to complete these works on engineering hours. Problem was that impact driving these tubular piles, which are 1.4 meter diameter, a few meters into the clay, well, the noise level obviously was, was completely out of the roof. So if we were to install these piles, we would have had to relocate more than 200 families, and that wasn't, wasn't allowed in our, in our DCO. So we had to completely change the way we were gonna deliver these works. So we look at different options, and this is a 3D model that we produce as a concept uh, to go for this uh, pipe jacking solution. So what we thought about was if we cannot do this in a dry environment uh, because we cannot build a cover dam, we'll have to probably look at a tunneling solution. And this is what we did. We look at lowering the level of the clap and culvert and go for a pipe jacking solution. How we were gonna do the pipe jacking uh, what we thought was we need to build a long chamber and a reception chamber, which is fine. The long chamber was also a coffer dam, but as we could uh, create a square uh, section that we can prop in, in, in inside, we could drive those seed piles with a super silent piling rig from Geeken, which I'll show you in a second. And then the other challenge that we had was obviously all these was gonna get inundated with every tide. So we had to ensure that there was no water ingress into the excavation drive. How we overcome that was by doing this. We created two lines of uh, seed piles, very short ones, that we drove under the bridge just to cut off into the clay. And then we replaced the terrace deposit, which obviously is a very, very permeable material with a lean concrete mix where then we could uh, tunnel through. Here you can see just yes, a, a little bit of the logistics of the, of the, of the works, which were, were quite complex. All the works had to be served by river because there was no access by land, so we had to complete all these works out of uh, Jacob Barge, bring all the uh, tunnel equipment, all the pipes, everything, everything by river. Here you can see a longitudinal section of the, of the permanent works design. So as you can see, we had this concrete slab that gave us another level of protection against the, the water ingress. And you can see here the long chamber, and here is the reception chamber. And these are the final connections that we will do with the existing uh, CSOs. This is a two sections of the, of, the, of the concrete pipes, the males and the females. We had to go for a completely bespoke pipe because of the constraints that we had uh, in the worst information in terms of durability. And also because we wanted to uh, ensure that with a single pass, so without a secondary lining, we were still to provide the waterproofing requirements in the contract. So what we did is we engaged with a precast concrete supplier and they design a jacking pipe with two levels of waterproofing. So you have the external gasket that gets compressed by this uh, steel collar. And then we had a second uh, water tennis uh, solution with another uh, set of uh, rubber gaskets. 
and here you can see the, the packers. Uh, we did a series of trials, both for the concrete mix to ensure that provided the durability and also water tightness, and the solution will prove to be very, very robust. So we managed to convince the client that the secondary lining wouldn't be, wouldn't be required in this case. And these are a few photos of the different stages of the works. So this photo in the left-hand side is uh, the piling of the, of the loan chamber. So you can see here is this uh, super silent piling rig. There's only two in the world that could drive those piles to the level that we required. And it went, it went pretty well. So there was very minor complaints from the neighbors in terms of works that were still carried out on engineering hours. Here on the right hand side, you can see the enabling works of the, uh, along the drive. So we had to, as I said, dig out all the river terraces and replace it by, um, by a lean mix. We also consider uh, to go rather than for an open face that obviously increases the risk of uh, water ingress to a closed face with a slurry machine. But I didn't mention that along this drive, we had historical drawings that were showing uh, the remaining of the foundations of the previous Vauxhall Bridge. So we, we had gone through a, with a, a closed phase solution and we, were, we had hit any obstructions underneath the bridge. I think that it would have been extremely complicated to record the machine, especially in a tidal environment. So that's why we went for this uh, open phase solution that for all in the first place doesn't look to be very suited for these uh, tidal conditions. And this is the setup that we had in the load chamber for the, for the jack works. So you can see here at the back the reaction wall, the jacking frame, these are the spacers because the stroke of the jacks were only 1.2 meters and the, and the pipes were 2.5. The push ring and then these are the, the pipes being lifted and the glam plate that we provided also a, le a level of protection against water coming back, coming back to us. These two photos are during the excavation. So you can see here the face. The top is this lean concrete mix that we used to, to replace the river terraces. The strength that we were looking for was something between six uh, to eight uh, megapascals. And at the bottom, we had the top le level of the, of the London clay. We ca completed these works only on day shifts. So what, we're, what you used to do is just bore the, the, the level of the clay after every sheet, shift. In the right hand side you can see also the excavation phase. So we complete the excavation of the majority of it with a brock and then here you can see the conveyor belt that we use to get the muck out of the phase into the uh, lawn chamber. And this is the final product which I think that it, 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 was, it was very successful. It took a little bit more time than what we expected especially because the tolerances on the joints was uh, very tight and we had to take out a few pipes and, and jack them again. But I think that the, all in all, I think that considering the challenges that we were facing uh, in the beginning, I think that the outcome was, was pretty good. So that's us uh, for today. So thank you very much. And I think that now we have some minutes for some questions that we'll try our best to respond. No? Yep, yes, please. Right, we will uh, bring mics around to those people. Could you uh, say your name and your affiliation before you uh, answer each of, you, of the questions, please? Please go ahead. Janis Vazeos from Aru. I would like to, first of all, I would like to thank the presenters for, for a great presentation. It was very lively and it's good to see like this kind of projects actually to, to the rest of us who are involved in the industry. Uh, I have a question for Jorge. And Jorge, previously you talked about like uh, probing and practically through your desk study, if I understood correctly, that essentially you eliminate the requirement for that. Yeah. Uh, I would be interested to, to hear your perspective in terms of like, we know that for instance in formations like London Clay, for example you have uh, sand lenses which are not always captured by boreholes or uh, nearby excavations let's say, because they vary in extent 
etc., etc. So, how did you manage the risk in your project in terms of that? No. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. As I told you, this was um, we managed to avoid the probing in uh, in uh, Falkenbrook, that is in the in the west part of uh, cent Tideway Central. The access level was above, so was in London Clay. There was there was no uh, uh, sand channels in that section. That's above uh, 60. It was the the access level was uh, 63.5. So uh, we were pretty much clear that there were no, no sun channels. And uh, we got an assessment by our, our designer, ACOM. Uh, we provided all the information and we got into, into that position, into that uh, situation. Thank you. Any other questions? Hi, uh, Guilherme from uh, SES at uh, HS2. Uh, to think, uh, Jaime, you uh, mentioned about the pipe jacking uh, operation. I saw that you had a very tight area where you're uh, launching your, your rig from, and you said you had no access there. How was that? Uh, how was the assembly of the pipe jacking, or how was all the logistics when lifting the rig in? And uh, did you do all the cranes or how, how was it? How's it like? Yeah, um, I think that if, if you see in the presentation this aerial picture w which shows a, a jack up barge with a, a crawler crane on top and then there is a service barge uh, next to it. So what we used to do is the service barge uh, w would be loaded uh, away and we'll bring first of all, uh, well, the, the obviously the, 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 the jack in frame and the shield of the pipe jacking, and then after it will be bringing the, the, the concrete pipes as, as needed. So every, all the works were serviced by, 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 by river. Similarly, all the macaway could be brought uh, into the long chamber and then skipped into a macaway barge that will be exchanged uh, whenever it was completed. So all the logistics were, were by river, which is probably the, the the aspiration of uh, most of the Taiwan sites. Andy Flowery from Bar Hill. Um, thanks all three of you for a very interesting and uh, uh, very wide-ranging presentation. Um, I. One well, particular question to Joan around the, um, the flexibility of your lining systems. That's very interesting to see all the different systems. I'm particularly uh, impressed with your full shutter system, which gave you the flexibility for curves. Um, just one question I have around the, um, in terms of the uh, installation or, or the injection of the concrete. Do you use external vibration in the shutters, or was it a self Yes, yeah, so um, it's a very good question because we iterated a lot. So we started with a, with a standard mix with, um, with vibrations or what we call screamers on the shutters. Uh, and the trial was not very bad, but wasn't as successful as it could be. So then we moved into a self-compacting mix and uh, it improved and we kept improving that uh, mix because um, when we were in Falconbrook, around 160 meters in, it was starting to have some honeycomb beans, some issues in the, in the construction joint. Um, and um, yeah, as I said, we started with our self-compacting mix one, number one, and we finished with number three. Um, and the evolution was from Cremont. Cremont started with a non-self-compacting mix, and we went straight away into a self-compacting mix. Why not do self-compacting mix since the very beginning? Because you know, you need to allow enough time for trials and we didn't, so that's the thing. Thank you, some useful lessons for future projects. Thank you very much. Any other questions? You must have answered everybody's uh, questions in your presentation.
Okay, right, well, we'll finish it to that. Um, let's do a final thank you to all three of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right, uh, we've got a few slides uh, to go through. Uh, the first one um, is that uh, Ferrovial are sponsoring a few rounds of drinks round at the Westminster Arms, which is out of the main door, left and left again. Unfortunately, we haven't got the bespoke bar downstairs. Um, they are having the same problem as the ICE are with bar staff. So we're upstairs. There is a tab, as I say, kindly... Uh, by Ferrovial. One possibility might be to be able to get on the tab if everybody takes a quick photo of that. Oh no, it's moved on. If you, just so that um, if you take a quick photo of that, you could show that to the bar and they'll uh, allow you a drink. I don't know, is that for the rest of June? <laughs> okay, next slide please. Right, the BTS Design and Construction Course 2022 is from the 4th to the 8th of July. As um, probably a lot of you know, um, very close to my heart as I've run it for the last 10 years on behalf of the BTS. There are still places available on the course. It's the five-day course at Warwick. Um, at the present time, we've got around about 60 people on it. There are still more spaces. I think the most we've ever had was around about 85. So please see if there's anybody in your organisations uh, who would benefit this uh, great course. Next slide, please. The uh, BTS conference, uh, I know we had one last year, but that was actually 2020 plus one year. So that is uh, on the 11th and 12th of October. For more information, you can visit the btsconference.com and the initial um, delegate fees are, are there. It should be a great two days. Next slide, please. Forthcoming events. The young members have got an evening lecture on the 1st of September. They also have a workshop on the 15th of September. And that is the same day as an evening lecture of the main BTS. For further details on the actual presentations, uh, please check on the website. <coughs> We've uh, got to the point now with the BTS specification, fourth edition, that we need peer review people. So if you are interested in peer reviewing the new specification that's been developed, uh, please contact uh, the BTS at BTS at the ICE and the members of the subcommittee will get in contact with you to help with peer reviewing the specification. Next. For those that attended the annual dinner, um, the link to the photos has been emailed out, but if for any reason you haven't got it, again, another quick photo, that's the uh, link to see if you can find yourself on the photos. Next, please. We are still progressing with the anniversary book. Sponsorship is still open. Web, uh, details are on the website, so if there's any companies or individuals out there that haven't sponsored the anniversary book, please get onto the website and take out uh, the various levels of sponsorship that are available. 
We are also looking for assistance with completing various tasks. Some of those are listed here. Again, if you wish to help out with research and archives and photos, we're in the latter stages, but we still have a lot of work required to complete the book. So again, please email into the BTS and we will put, put you in contact with the uh, appropriate member of the subcommittee. Next one, please. Right, we have a little uh, three to four minute video here which explains what transforming tunneling safety are doing. So I'll leave it to the video to explain. Welcome to this overview of the Transforming Tunneling Safety Group. Originally formed via interested client organisations who wanted to drive step change in the health, safety and well-being of the tunneling industry. Safety standards and performance have improved considerably over the decades, but the Transforming Tunneling Safety Group wants to help deliver a further positive shift in performance. Free access to TTS content and resources is kindly hosted on the British Tunneling Society's website. And this video provides guidance on accessing the content, the benefits of doing so, and how you can contribute to further improve our web pages. The Transforming Tunneling Safety Group provides safety videos, relevant health, safety and well-being alerts, good practice guides and proposals, as well as other useful information for the industry. This has all been supplied by previously successful tunnel projects. We really encourage members to use this content with your workforce briefings so that we can all improve health, safety and well-being performance. So in addition, we encourage members to submit content based on your experiences, skills and lessons learned in the field. Through this collaborative way of working, we can make the tunneling industry safer and healthier for everyone that works in it. Accessing the content via the British Tunneling Society website couldn't be easier. Simply select the TTS shortcut on the homepage or the red quick links bar. From here you can access a number of resources, including real life lessons of health, safety and well-being incidents, a range of good practice guides. These have been researched, developed and published by individual organisations or projects. You may find them to be useful references when planning your works. A range of safety videos, contact details for TTS representatives, and our skate matrix. The matrix was developed to be used by clients, contractors, and employers to define competence and improve safety and productivity on tunneling projects. Updated annually with feedback and inputs from the sector, the matrix clarifies the skills, knowledge, attitude, training, and experience required for most occupations within the industry. Videos are an excellent way of engaging the workforce. All our safety video content has been submitted to the Transforming Tunneling Safety Group by industry-leading organisations. Considerable investment has been made to create impactful videos that cover key risks and outcomes. The video was very easy to find on the website and when I played it to the workforce and for everybody in the, in the room, um, they were really engrossed to it and they, you can literally hear a pin drop when we were playing it. My name's Lawrence Denman. I uh, watched the safety video this morning. thought it had a really good visual impact and you're going to remember it when you go outside. We encourage everyone in the tunneling industry to submit resources to make the website better. And you can do so via the Submit Contents to TTS Here link on the homepage. All content is vetted before becoming available for members to use. And for organisations that submit content, the logos will appear in the contributors section of the website, so everyone can see who the leading organisations in the industry are. By industry members submitting content, the website will become even more relevant and beneficial. Thank you for watching this video. As you can see, the Transforming Tunneling Safety Group is working hard to offer easily accessible, up-to-date, relevant content to improve health, safety and well-being for the entire industry. Don't forget, we really need your contributions too, so please submit any content you can. Right, I think that... Uh concludes tonight. Um, if you've missed any of those contact 
details, all these um, recent presentations are on the YouTube, so you can search under BTS June meeting. So if you need any of the contact details for any of the slides that we've just put up, uh, and to relook at the, uh, the presentation that we had this evening. So thank you very much, and let's all adjourn to the Westminster Arms.